Welcome to the second video in the series on color, using the system of color that I've devised so that understanding color at all times of day is easy for the artist to understand. In the video you're going to see shortly, you'll see me do two paintings. I'm going to complete a painting that will demonstrate how to use color correctly in noon light, and also how to use color correctly when you want to convey the feeling of evening light before sunset. In these two paintings I will talk about the colors I use as I use them so that you'll understand why it's important to keep within the families of color that you've been told to use for your pictures. These colors are divided into two families, warm and cool. And when I show you those colors, you'll understand that in order to depict correct lighting, using warm colors in the sunshine and using the cool family when you're doing distance or shadow areas, you will always, always be able to convey correct color to the viewer. Canvas comes right out of the package, white. And white is beautiful if that's what you want in your painting, but when you're working with color, white is at the very highest end of the value scale. I always start with a canvas that has been toned to take its value down to about a five. I'm going to reduce the value of my canvas by the application of something to it to make it go down to about a value five, which is right here. Does it matter what color you use? No. I'm going to be using a burnt umber on this one. And then after it's on, I'll let it dry. Some days when I'm in the studio and I just don't feel like painting, I'll prep canvases this way. Pretty soon I'm thinking about what I want to paint and then I can't wait to get back to painting. I rub it with a paper towel to remove the excess mineral spirits and also to give me more of a uniform surface on which to work. Now you can see that my canvas has gone down to a value 5. On my palette, I've arranged all of the colors that I use in all of the paintings in this video. There are a total of only 12 colors. I have a family of warm colors, five, and a family of cool colors, also five, plus two earth tones and my white. That's it. There are no other colors needed or necessary for painting any time of day that you wish to depict. When I actually use them on my palette, I have them in pill boxes. These are seven day oversized pill boxes. The cools are arranged in their family with two whites in one pill box. And the warm family is arranged here in these pill boxes with the two earth tones on the end. This is just convenient for me. I find it most useful to be able to just reach for the box that has the warms in it when I'm painting sunlight and to reach for the box with the cools in it when I'm painting either distance or shadow areas. By keeping them organized this way, I very seldom make mistakes when I'm actually doing a painting. I want to emphasize also that although this is an oil painting video, the color system will work for virtually any medium because the pigments that we use as artists are the same. Ultramarine blue is ultramarine blue, whether you're using oils, acrylics, pastels, watercolor, gouache, or any of the other types of media that we may choose to use as artists. This painting that I'm doing for you today is Noon Light. The subject matter is going to be this photograph, which shows a horse and rider heading towards the show arena. The nice thing about this is you'll also get to see me do a lot of reflected light. Notice the very small shadow underneath the figure. I'm going to draw this in, and I'm going to be sure when I do my drawing to place my figure on the left hand side of the canvas. The horse will not be dead center as some artists would tend to do it, but I'm going to put it slightly off center. On my palette, I mix up a dark. Now for me, a, a, I can make a beautiful black out of my cool colors using the red and the green, which is alizarin crimson and phthalo green. Those two together make any number of, of dark blacks, grays, and other nondescript colors. So my horse and rider are going to be here sort of a, a good focal point. And I'm going to be sure to incorporate my shadow shape as an integral part of the design because 
that is going to tell the viewer that it's noon light. Noon light is so powerfully affected by the sky that's above it. Every single area that is not illuminated by sunlight is going to be powerfully influenced by the sky above. All shadow areas, all shadows under the horse, these areas are all going to be influenced towards the blue end of the spectrum. I now have my drawing on the canvas and you'll see that I've modified quite seriously the background from the original photograph to depict a much better overall design. I've given my horse a place to walk into. I've also stopped that forward action somewhat by the addition of some poles that'll have flags on it. And I've completely altered the background both to enhance the white upside of the horse's back end and tail area and also to emphasize the area down by the legs and where the shadow will be located so that you can clearly see how we're going to be addressing noon light. The illumination for this subject was coming straight overhead and because of that our shadows are small and well confined underneath the objects that are making them and because of that I'm going to emphasize these shadow areas for your benefit in this in this 12 by 16 study to show you how noon light, how we handle the colors in noon light. Starting out with my darks, knowing that all of my shadows are going to be influenced by blue, ultramarine blue, I, let, I start with ultramarine blue as a major aspect of all of my darker mixes for my shadow areas and for the lower, lower sides of foliage. So these shadow areas are going to be quite dark and ultramarine blue with a little bit of the color that is inherent in the actual um, object. For example, the horse is walking forward on green grass, so this will end up being blue-green. These are all quite dark, these two little pots over here, and their shadows are going to be dark and also influenced by the blue of all of the sky that's over top of the, fi the figures and the things in our composition. Moving right along, let's go ahead and paint our, our shadowy sides of our bushes that are a little further away. Notice how I stay with my cool palette. My cool palette, of course, is ultramarine, thalo, alizarin, yellow ochre, the radiant or lemon yellow, and whites. This white on the left I'm going to be using for my cool mixes, and this white that's in the seventh bin of my pillbox is used to mix all of my warm mixes over here. So let's just go ahead and lay in some of these shadowy sided bush colors. But let's go ahead and lay in a little bit of the distant mountains and the distant um, um, landscape to give you some more ideas. Again, slightly influenced by blue because anything that gets further away from the viewer is going to have in it the sky's influence. So this is a beautiful color to paint my distant mountains. but because I'm changing the, the palette just a little bit, uh, I'm going to go ahead and put in a little distant uh, greenish blue, blue-green, in order to, again, to complement what I have going on in my foreground. It's a nice middle value in my background, and the reason I picked a nice value, middle value, this is going to be quite dark, and the back of the hor horse's head neck area, the crest here is going to be quite light, so if I go dark and light, I've got to have a middle value in order for it to show up. There's some distant um, covered canopies here, which makes a complex area that counterbalance the complexity of the horse, uh, and this complexity over here will keep your eye interested. When you work with um, what a, a photograph gives you, usually it's not nearly enough to make an interesting uh, painting. So as artists, it's our obligation to make a far more interesting background. Now, I dipped into my warms over here, my warm yellow greens, because the top edge of these, of these bushes are going to have a lot more light in them. And I'm going to stay, see these are, these are barrels that, that are bushes. The top edge of my vegetation here is also going to have a lot more yellow in it, coming up and contrasting against the white background of the white of the horse that I haven't painted yet. And my, my grass is also going to have a strong yellow influence because guess what folks? It's in the sunlight. So when I paint the grass area, I can go ahead and I can paint it in the yellow influence of direct sunlight on grass. Isn't this fun? Whee! 
I'm using about a 5 8 inch brush, a filbert, just to, just to lay in some real strong brushwork, directionally taking you into the painting, which is always good for compositional reasons. And I'm just putting some broad, bright yellow in here, and I'm just going around and not even worrying about the color of the, the horse's legs yet, because all of that will fall into place later. You see how beautifully quick this can come together? Now, as I move away from, oops, as I move away from, the horse and rider in my noon light, I'm going to have more influence of the sky overhead. And with that influence of the sky overhead, I'm going to see more blue come into this and I'm going to move back to my cooler colors with my greens. And you will see immediately that even though I stay the same value, as I move away, the intensity is reduced. The, the powerfulness of the color is reduced. I add a little blue to it because of the influence of the sky bouncing around and I move, even though it's in sunshine, it's getting lighter and less intense as it moves away. It's still green, but it's not nearly as powerful as this green. See, the transition between this powerful yellow and this area up here is so strong that we want to make sure that we see the illusion of distance. Powerful contrast between the yellow <clears throat> that's here in the foreground and this grayer, bluer color that's appearing further up in the, <clears throat> in the composition. You see, that's how we handle distance on a two-dimensional surface. We change the intensity of the color and we also change its warmth. In the, in the foreground, we stay powerful. As we move away, we get lighter, bluer, and grayer. As things go further back into the picture plane, they become less contrasty. This may be in deep shadow according to your photograph, but this area out here around the arena cannot possibly be as strongly depicted as the shadows you've got in this foreground. There has to be a lighter value of shadow because as things progress off into the distance, no matter what time of day it is, the, sh the values get closer together. The contrast between light and dark is lessened. Some distant trees that are uh, landscaping shrubs, and I need to put in a few of them back here in order to indicate to the viewer that behind the arena there's some larger trees. Now, notice they are bluer than the yellow that's on top of this. Even though they themselves also have some sunlight falling on them, they are bluer than the ones that are nearby. Okay, a little more distant mountain out here, the little yellow ochre mixed in. And I, the reason I'm putting the yellow ochre right there is because, guess what color the jacket is? It's blue. So by enhancing that mountain that's behind it, by adding a little yellow ochre in these areas lower down, when I hit that blue jacket, it's really going to be a strong contrast. And it'll be very attractive, I hope. Thinking, thinking, always thinking. Distant areas of the mountain, again contrasting against the rider whose dark jacket is going to be a secondary focal point. This is just white that's being added to texture up the mountain shape that I'd already put in there. I'm not exactly following my original line and the reason I'm not following my original line is because uh, to do so I would have a frame cut the top of that mountain. When you think about your paintings, framing them is a contingency that has to have adjustment. For example, if I put a frame, I'd be cropping the top of that mountain. And that's not a good plan when you want to make a painting that's going to look good to the viewer. So I've got in about oh, a good portion of my painting. Not bothering to clean my brush, because cleaning one's brush is a... <laughs> well, you only do it when you have to, okay? See how this is working out? And I, I'm not going to put in that tail until all of this has had a chance to set up for a day or so. As artists, it's our responsibility to let the viewer know that we've got something going on that's, that's, uh, that is believable. Here we've got this flat two-dimensional surface and we have to sell the idea that this flat two-dimensional surface has depth and distance in it. And the only way we can really effectively do that is with color. So as I'm painting this first underlaying in, I'm constantly being aware that this area down here is more pure, more intense, 
yellower in the sunlight on this green grass. And then as we move up towards the back, we get lighter, we get grayer, we get the values closer together. That's just basic uh, physics of how distance is handled in painting. Cleaning my brush now because I want to put in uh, an, an illusion of sky. Illusion of sky. <laughs> I say illusion because skies are, are definitely an illusion. I could sit there and mix white and pure blue and slap a chunk of it up there and it's garish. It is way too strong. Skies are very seldom straight blue and white. There are skies like that, but it, they're, they're more often than not, you're going to have some atmospheric haze. Now, noon light creates a rather um, glaring sky at the edges of the mountains. The three colors that you use to make skies are alizarin crimson, yellow ochre, and ultramarine blue plus white. So in this sky, I am having only a whisper of alizarin. And the reason I only have a, a whisper of alizarin is because alizarin comes into play when we do sunsets. Then alizarin takes over. But during a noontime sky, what we have showing up generally is a sky that's very powerfully influenced by that blue with maybe a hint of yellow ochre in it because of, uh, because of atmospheric stuff. And then what we do is we take our brush and we softly blend the transition zone between the mountains and the sky. I use my finger and my brush because at distance edges are lost and the edges of this mountain need to be lost. You don't need a crisp edge on anything that's more than 300 feet away from the viewer, from you, the viewer. So soften edges as you move away. These distant trees right in here will also have a softer edge than the, than the highlight that I haven't yet put on the top of this hedge. So as things come towards you, the edges get more distinct. Isn't this fun? Because it's like finger painting. Now, I finger paint and I'm very careful and mindful of the toxicity of oil paints. And so I always use some heavy-duty hand lotion. This is Gold Bond. Uh, corn huskers, any other heavy-duty hand lotion slathered on my hands before I begin to paint creates a good barrier. And the, when I wash my hands after I paint, the oils that are on my fingers just literally fall right off. So I'm not too worried about it. You see my strongest edge is here and here. My horizon line is above the midpoint right about in the shadow area underneath that um, uh, tent. I'm going to lose the edge of that hat because hat, I think it's going to be a little bit different in design. When you've got a lot of paint on your canvas, you can play around like this. The white of this horse is very white across his back. You see how far away we are from white? That white is inappropriate for two reasons. One, there's a slight warming that needs to happen. White is your coldest, coldest color. If I'm going to paint that horse, I'm going to make sure that I get him white with a little touch of cadmium orange. Cadmium orange is your sunlight color that tells the people around you that you've got white in sunlight. We have two delicious places where that happens. Now, if I were to do that on that distant back here, it would not read correctly. It would be way too close. So what I do is I take white, but I mix a little blue in it, and I paint that, whatever you want to call that thing back there, that shed, that oversized gargantuan tent housing all the spectators. And you see that by not making it as orangey white as this, it pushes it back into the background. There's also some of it over here. Anytime I paint anything that's in shadow, I add ultramarine blue to it. Even something red in shadow will go towards the purple side. So you can make a blue-green shadow and it reads right. The, the sunlight is making everything that's in the actual sunlight warm, but anything that is influenced by the sunlight can be blue or blue-green and it will read right to the viewer. Not blue-violet, but blue-green. So as I lighten up the shadow area under this horse, I take it to the blue-green level and it becomes readable. Your photograph will show that shadow as being perfectly black. And woe is you if you paint it that way, because then anybody who looks at your work will say, Aha! 
he or she was using a photograph for reference and was not paying attention to what the light was really supposed to tell you. You can see now that as I pull the blue-green into the shadow areas of virtually everything that's here, the blue-green reads right. We've got green grass, blue sky overhead, and you end up with blue-green shadow shapes. The jacket on this rider is blue. Oh, is it blue. But when the blue comes into the sunlit side, since you already know that I'm going to be in the sunshine with that part of the jacket, you know I'm going to have to shift to my hot blue in order for it to read right when you actually see the jacket in sunlight. So first I lay in the jacket, just drawing what I see in the photograph, using pure ultramarine blue, lots of thick paint. See this part of the jacket is done in absolutely perfect ultramarine blue because it's influenced so strongly by the sky that to make it any other color would be a travesty. But how much fun do we have when we go to the warm side and we paint the sunlit side of this jacket. I go over here to Thalo Blue and I mix the warm bin of my warm white so I don't get these colors compromised. I mix the warm white that's here with the Thalo Blue of the hot side, my warm side of the palette with the warm bin of white paint and I get a, a gorgeous color that when I lay it in it's going to read right to you, the viewer, as being a jacket in sunlight. The wavelength of Thalo Blue reads correctly as sunlit blue. When we paint the details like this, you've got to have noon light, with the, with, but if the object is blue, it has to be warm blue in the sunlight. You can see now that it's starting to hold up. You get this strong feeling of overhead light coming straight down on this figure's jacket. Okay, let's take a look at this. We've got sunlight on the back of the horse creating this white light area. We have a transition zone where we go from sunlight to shadow, right in here. Down in here, we're still influenced by the sky. It's still all in shadow. But as we turn and go down and all of these planes of the horse's anatomy in shadow show up, we're going to see a lot of bounce light coming off that yellow grass. That transition zone between the lit side and the shadow side is what is called the limb, that's spelled L-I-M. And the limb is a dark transition zone that's darker than the reflected light area, powerfully influenced by the color of the sky. And we already know the color of the sky is... Yep, it's blue. So as we move across to the shadow sides of this horse, we get a blue area, a rather dark blue area, of transition. But the transition zone is, at this point, powerfully influenced by the sky. As we move further south on this horse, we go through two, two transition zones. The first transition zone takes us from the blue to a blue-violet. I add a little touch of red and lighten it slightly. The blue-violet is the lack of influence of the sky and the influence of the gray distance of the, let's say, these hills. So when you start seeing this, you're not as, you're not as powerfully influenced by the limb, but you still get the influence of that variation of distance. It's not being influenced by all of this yet. It's a transition zone between the sky, which is that blue line, and the upcoming reflected light that's going to show up shortly. Now as we move further down under the horse, we get more influenced by the sunlight and the warm coming up, but we do not paint this with warm colors. We paint it using the cool side of the palette. Why? Because it's in shadow. So as I come further down on this horse, I'm going to be showing more of that yellow influence of the grass, especially on these areas now, if I painted that with warm orange or warm yellow, I, it would never have read right to you. You would have looked at it and said, hmm, nice painting, but not spectacular. Spectacular comes when the color is right. Darker as it goes under the horse. And it's darker in a mixture of all three of my cool red, yellow, and blue, yellow ochre, alizarin crimson, and um, 
ultramarine blue here. So as it gets darker, it gets, actually gets grayer. Details come later. You have to be careful not to make your darks too dark. Because to do so would make, a, uh, make the, would make it not work for the way the viewer sees things or wants to see things. You can see how it's starting to come to life. Okay, back to painting the lights. But in my first time of doing this, what I need to make sure that I do is that I set the bar high for the actual color that I see here. Now, this horse actually is a little good. I got it. He wasn't quite that dark on that shoulder. I have to pull that leg back a little bit. Now, I'll show you how I fix that kind of an anatomical problem when I discover it soon enough. Yeah, his leg's not back far enough under him. So, here's how we fix that. I mix up the background color and literally cut into the leg where that's going to need uh, a little bit of surgery. This leg has to come back. So you see I bring that in using the background color. Not only does this allow me to add more paint, but it also allows the uh, painting to really start to look sumptuous. Yeah. Now we're getting it. And then there's this one blip of light here and there. And oh, it's turning out to be a nice little picture. I can't put the tail in. Ooh, I want to put the tail in. Now the same issue of transition zones happens on the rider's leg. We have the light of the light of the leg. We have the limb zone, which is blue, the transition area. Which you see me painting in here. And then we have the reflected light, a little purpley. And then we have an area of even brighter light coming up. That's all this bounce light coming off the back of the horse that's going to make those legs even lighter. It's a real interesting phenomenon. And there is this magic spot. There's so many magic spots in paintings. This is a magic spot right here. That magic spot. Yeah. <laughs> Life is good. Now a little influence here on these little pots. See, painting into the wet paint here, it does work, but uh, sometimes painting into the paint in other locations won't work. Yeah, and it happens, it comes with experience, people. It really does. Um, there's nothing, uh, it, it, nothing about this business of painting. Miles of canvas, miles of canvas. Every time you pick up a brush, miles of canvas. That's what makes it go. Okay, I'm going to mix up some more of the background mountain color. Notice how I pick up remaining paint that's on my palette, just picking up various and sundry mixes, knowing because the grayer it is, the better. And we, the way we get gray paint is to pick up old paint that's already there. And uh, I got to get these flags in here. I got to clean up this tree. This this will look like parked cars back here. And if we lighten up underneath the uh, awning to make it look like there's people back in there, and make a few flecks of darker stuff, then people then you'll see all those people standing back there. Break up the roof just a little bit to make it more interesting. But you get that feeling of noon light, blue shadows, blue influences on everything that's not in the sunlight, and it starts to really happen. Uh, let's get a flagpole in there. I can do that now because that doesn't require a brain surgeon. <laughs> At least I don't think it does. Flagpole one, flagpole two. Uh, flags. Oh, let's see, a little red flag maybe. Now here's the neat thing about a red flag. In sunlight it's going to be red, but as it changes over to shadow, guess where it goes? You saw this red, now it's going to here for the shadow. 
I'll add a little white to it. White, adding white to it will not hurt, but it will definitely put it in shadow. And we'll make the other one yellow and white. Why? Just because. And we got the white in there. And now she's headed for the arena. Doing noon light is painting, letting blue influence anything that's in the shadow with this canopy of blue sky that's overhead and watching that you keep your warm colors in the sunlit side of your subjects and you only paint the shadow side using the cool five colors plus your whites and you'll end up with a very decent painting. By the time this is finished, I know this is going to be a real good one. We're back and the painting is on the easel. It's been a little while and so the paint is tacky dry to the touch. The only places it may still be wet is the back of the horse. And what we're going to be doing now is doing the details. When you have a color plan and follow the color plan, you don't deviate from it now that you have all of this beautiful color in place, but now we just do the little embellishments that are needed to finish it. And for this, I'm going to be using a smaller brush. The brush I'll be using happens to be a quarter of an inch filbert, about a size two. Putting in some details behind the rider's hands. And so I'm just going to do that with remembering that noon light makes blue shadows, so of course the shadows under the horse's mane are going to be blue and white. And it is behind the saddle. Looks like a stubbin. English saddle. And where it is in shadow, the saddle will be alizarin, but where that white edged saddle pad comes out into the sunlight, it's going to be this lovely, brilliant cadmium red light. Into the shadow area again, it goes down and becomes alizarin. You can see quite easily how fairly simple this whole process is. It's a, men a matter of mentally watching and thinking about each color as you use it so that it ends up being the right one when you put it down. This video is not about painting horses, but it's more about how light is handled. If I were painting a white vase on the edge of a table, I would handle it no differently. I would have my light areas um, filled with orange, and I would have my shadow areas filled with palette colors that are from my cool side. So even though I happen to be painting a horse in this first exercise, the um, reality of it is, is it applies to virtually any subject that you choose. In my second painting on this video, I'm doing a, a uh, evening light barn, so it, it does not really matter what your subject is, it matters how you handle the color, whether you get it to read right. You can take these colors and you can push them into new and different directions. If you maintain the, the loyalty to the palette, cool for shadow and warm for sunlight, even though you push them way off into a different spectral arena, you'll still have an accurate painting and the viewers will find your subject matter extremely believable. For the tail, I actually shift down to one smaller brush. It's a round, and it's a number four round, but the fours hold a lot of paint. The tail is very beautiful. It comes out and flows. I want to make sure I keep that tail color. There's two, two mixes for the tail. There's the lit side, and then there's the shadow side. The shadow side has an awful lot of yellow ochre in it little touch of blue, which will take it down to the green. And that shadow side is right down in here. Oh, a little too light. So, more blue, more yellow ochre. And why? Because the blue and the yellow ochre are two cool colors, ultramarine and yellow ochre. And the, uh, we, at noon, we have the color, the color of the grass throwing up a little green, but we still have the blue of the sky influencing, so I add the ultramarine to make that yellow ochre go to the green side, but still maintain its identity. Am I in this picture? Yes. Yeah, so. before the edge of the canvas 
because I don't want a frame to actually come in and crop it. shadow shapes that we've created. Clean up that shadow just a tad. Clean up this one too. Cleaning it up meaning making it accurate to my reference material without losing the spontaneity. No, much better. And that tail of course is creating a broken shadow across the grass. Distance, reds go towards magenta. You can add white to them. If they're in sunlight, you can mix a little cad red light into them. But I want to put some people back in here. Some in sunlight, just to add to more color. Maybe I can get away without putting another figure in there since I do have these large shapes. Oh, I have a bug in my sky. <laughs> and I need to put some light back there. Now, because they're at distance, they're going to have some blue in them because of the atmosphere, as you know we can actually give the illusion of yeah, that'll be a road coming down. I can do that. Make a nice breakup of line. And yeah, it just adds, adds more interest at distance. And then there is a fence way off in the distance. There's also a telephone pole, so I'll put a telephone pole here. I don't know, I don't know. There's so many electrical wires that one has in, in shows like this. These kinds of little details have to be play, placed particularly carefully so that you can that the viewer will read them for what they're supposed to be. And yet you don't want to give them so much detail that they say, oh well that's that's you don't let me think I can figure it out. imperative to have it read right. Yeah, that's what my dog says, she grunts. She says, yep, gotta make it read right, Mom. And you can see now that by enhancing the colors of the yellows in the foreground, we have brilliant sunshine, and by pulling it back and making it grayer and bluer in the distance, we, we effectively convey distance. The subject matter that I have chosen for the painting is a composite of several photographs that I took many years ago up along Highway 1 uh, going out towards Morro Bay. These photographs are, are quite old, but I think that what I want to convey with the sunset light will be most effective using these three photographs. Let's see, my focal point. Uh, I love that big mountain. Hollister Peak, it's called. And I think I'll lower it just a little bit so that I have an opportunity to put some clouds above it because they'll be beautiful illuminated in the evening light. You know, I, I went by this particular landscape several years ago and it's completely changed which is why I paint so many things in Southern California, because you turn around, it's a housing development. By making it beautiful for all time, what we have is posterity. You can look at the paintings and know that this is the way it looked at that particular moment in time. What I'm using is odorless mineral spirits to clean up some of the, to clean up my lines. It's a real good way to do that. Um, and then quickly, redraw whatever it is you need to redraw. So we're going to paint this scene as you see it now. We're going to paint this in evening light. I use a glass scraping razor blade that you can get from any hardware store or home improvement store and quickly scrape off 
the remainder of my color from my glass palette. Underneath the glass palette, I may have mentioned, it's gray. And the reason it's gray is because I can see better color on a gray palette than I can on this white. It's just too light. So my palettes are always neutral gray. Sunlight, cadmium orange, every color in the shadow, alizarin crimson. So with that thought in mind, I'm going to start mixing my colors and playing and putting them up here to cover this canvas completely. The, keeping in mind that if it's in light, it's going to have cadmium orange in the mix. If it's in shadow, it's definitely going to have alizarin in the mix. And the reason is because of the long wavelength of red light that comes through a tremendous amount of atmosphere as the sun is going down. Backside of my mountain in distance, starting up at the top just for fun, what am I going to have in my shadow? Alizarin crimson. So if I start laying in some of the color that's going to be up there in that mountain, it's ultramarine blue, white, and alizarin crimson. Now granted, at the base of these mountains, uh, at the base of this very well-known rock mountain, is an awful lot of greenery and shrubbery, and I'll be putting those in also. But definitely, because of the time of day, we're going to have alizarin crimson up there, and blue for distance. Because this, the night sky that's coming in is going to be a dark indigo blue, that's your moonlight sky, and so we want to make sure that the viewer is aware of the, the night sky coming in from this side and our sunlit side where the sun is over here. Now my distant trees, phthalo green, a little sap green to warm them up because of the distance, red if they're in shadow, and because of distance a little cool, a little white to lighten them up, and I'm going to add some yellow ochre because of the bounce light of the, of the warm sky and of course a little blue for distance. So we've got a color for our distant trees on the mountain. Oh, there's a lovely, lovely bunch of them in here. And it's all based on this logic. You want to darken down some of those trees. Remember, if it's in shadow, you know what you have to add to it. A little alizarin crimson. Because if it's in shadow, it's got alizarin. That's the rule. And now in our foreground, of course, we have a tree that has a shadow side. And, of course, the shadow side is also going to have alizarin in it. So we'll stick that shadow side in. Nearby tree, higher contrast of values. So when I do the sunlit side of the tree, it will have a lot more of the contrast in it. We've got this lovely edge of the barn shaped by a tree's shadow side. A little more purple off in the distance back here. Oh, got a little blue in that. So I'll lighten it up. Notice I don't clean my brush or my palette because when I know what my colors are going to be, I have a great deal of success mixing them into the colors that are already there. Distant Hills, yellow ochre, that's orange for distance. A little touch, because it's sunlight, a little touch of the cadmium orange to warm it up. And distance, things are lighter. So we add white. Again, we're just painting in what we see. And so we continue to add yellow ochre, a little white, a little cat orange, and we continue to paint our beautiful, beautiful hillsides. As we get closer with this whole concept, we add more orange. Notice I'm not concerned about edges at this point. Where I know I'm going to have a dark, I will go ahead and make sure that I have a light area next to it. And of course, lots and lots of paint. I have some lovely light areas in front of the barn that I'm going to be sure to emphasize using the warm colors that I want you to enjoy. I'm going to go back to some of my tree color and bring in that line of trees. where I know I'm going to need some 
interesting color and shape behind my barn. And you can see that my design pattern is sort of a symphony of rocking motions coming down to the viewer. In my sunlit areas, I may have a lovely bunch of trees and sunlight, but I, I must add yellow and orange to that green in order to get a true read for what the color is in evening light. So these trees that are in that strong evening light have a tremendous amount of orange in them. And of course as I move closer to the viewer the contrast is greater and the orange is more pronounced. Now you know that I'm going to have a barn that has a front on it that's going to be full in sunlight. So of course I take my white, I touch it with orange, and I can show you just how far away from white we really are. I put that up there as a note to remind myself how far I have to go before I reach the full, full lightness that I have in my value range for this painting. Now the roof of the barn is reflecting an awful lot of that sky and that evening sky is running towards purple and gray. I'm going to push it a little more towards the blue side, but I'm going to keep the value fairly dark and I'm also going to gray it. And I gray it by the addition of its complement, which in this case is the yellow ochre. And I put that color up there to show you where my barn is going to be, my barn roof line. Details are things like these little posts on the top of the, of the barn itself, vents, dovecotes, whatever they are. These large areas of color establish the time of day, and then we can embellish them later as we start to play around with the details. In the sunlit area of the mountains up here, I'm going to have the illumination of the sun onto an object that is not inherently warm in color. It's far enough away so that it will have orange and white in it, but it also has blue. However, I'm going to change to the blue that is the warm blue and also the warm red and the warm orange to create the necessary color to get that sunlit mountain side to be believable for you, the viewer. Mixing up warms, using my warm blue, my warm red, my warm yellow, and all of my other colors available to me on the palette to make that sunlit side of those rocks really pop. And there are there is vegetation on these rocks but uh, at distance, they sort of fade away to a real pale, pale blue-green because there's so much blue influencing them. So we paint them in kind of as a dark, dark mark with just a whisper of green in there. And as we get closer, of course, we use more of our light, warm colors. California grass, in, in when it's dry, tends to be a golden color. You can use burnt sienna and white to get that. I'm mixing up a lot of it because it's going to be really useful. And you can also depict the distant areas of your grassy sloped hillside with this. Oh, it's so pretty. And you got distant sunlight on this mountain over here, rolling down. Use more yellow ochre because of the distance. Come up and roll those colors across. Same with this. Get more yellow ochre in it. Golden sunlight evening. Shadow areas on the ground and the nearby are really a lovely shade of purple because of the evening light again. So anytime you have a shadow in the foreground area where you have your most contrast, you can go ahead and be real bold and come in there with a beautiful mix of ultramarine blue and alizarin and make a real strong shadow. And that's going to be a fence, so 
I want to make sure that the shadow area on this side of the fence is really strongly depicted on a small shed right here. Tweak that in. A little bit lighter section of roof on the barn proper. Paint that in so it shows up a little better. Again, there's alizarin in it. And then we have a red roof that's almost in sunshine. So we lighten it up using white and orange and stay with our red. Add a little burnt sienna to it because it's been around in the sunshine for a while. And we just put that roof right in there. Shadow side of the barn. Now the sky is influenced by the evening light as well. Towards the right hand side, the sky is going to actually have a touch of orange in it and yellow ochre, a breath of blue because it's a blue sky. But that light color of that sky up there reads as evening light because of the influence of the sun that's coming in from this side. Add a little blue to it, not much, but keep it nice and light. As you move towards the clouds that we're going to be putting in, we're going to add more blue to it. But for just for now, this holds up well to read as our sky on this location. And most of you would probably end up taking straight blue and going, yep, we've got to make the sky that color. You don't want to have a sky that blue. You want the blue influence up there, but you don't want the blue that close to your actual sky location. So as I dip into my cool colors and I add white to it, add a little yellow ochre to it, and a little touch of alizarin to it, and there's my sky color right there. Now put a little rough edge on that so it looks like there's trees up there, which there are. Because the edge of the cloud is going to be in the sunshine, I'm going to darken the sky right behind it. So as we move over to our, the other side of our clouds, we're going to add a lot more blue and a little touch of alizarin to that sky color and darken it down because the back side of our clouds will be slightly darker. So let's go ahead and hit this cloud with a white edge right up to the mountain. Oh, it's so pretty. And as we move back, we're going to mix in some of that sky color, take it down in value, get some shadowing to it. But it still looks like a cloud because it's lighter than the sky that's behind it. The good old Hollister Peak is starting to come alive. We have to, there's a, a distinct shape to this mountain that I'll have to get to when I'm ready to paint the details. A little further away, yeah. Oh, it's so pretty. I love painting clouds. They're so forgiving because they don't really have <laughs> uh, any, any true shape that you have to think about. You can, you can fool with them a little bit more than you can. <laughs> horses, uh, you can't fool with horses that, that much. They have to look like horses no matter what. Hmm, make sure I got the mountain right. Yeah, down it goes. Yeah, looking good. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to go ahead and very quickly, with a slightly smaller brush, the same one I used to make the drawing, lay in the front of that barn so I'll have something to work with when I return. The barn is absolutely the whitest shape in the whole painting. So my first layer at this point is just going to be kind of an interesting white. Really does punch it up, doesn't it? Nice barn. A few more details. Since the paint's wet and we can handle it, I'll go ahead and put those in. There's a neat little water trough right here. I can't help it. I can't resist. i got to put it in the edge of a water trough right there. That will come in later. With the whole thing laid in, with all these colors down, I have literally nailed the time of day. And therefore, when I come back, it will definitely have the colors in place and I will have a guide to keep me going with the time of day. Done quickly, big fields of color, a logical system of picking the right colors for the particular area you're painting. You can't help but be successful. However, it does take practice. Our second pass on this particular painting is going to be to enhance the feel of the sunset by utilization of more of the cadmium oranges in the, in the 
details that I'll be painting and also to, to embellish and make my transition zones between the light the the shapes that are on the canvas it's kind of tacky dry it's been sitting around for a day I love classic oils classic artist oils um, made by Tricoat and I'll put the website up on the screen um, Tricoat I mean here it's been one day and they're already tacky dry most oil paints when you apply them this thickly do not dry out nearly as quickly as the Tricoat and I'm going to start by making the sunset light on the front of the barn stronger by reducing its whiteness and making it far more warm with the orange of sun, sun almost a passing sunset light Make it, it's, the true whiteness of it is it's truly white but because of the evening light it's got to have more of an orange cast on it and when I put in the shadows of these groups of, of shrub and oak on the slope up here, you'll see that I will add a strong alizarin to the shadow and um, they will be purple because they'll be blue from the sky, but alizarin and due to distance, they'll be lighter than the shadows that will be down here. These shadows are quite dark and the shadows up higher in the painting are lighter. And they're that lovely purple that you see on the shadow side of the rock faces that are up, up at the highest point. Enhancing the feel of the sunset light. That's the characteristic of this particular painting. Now mixing in a little green to that alizarin mix, I get a gray color, which will suit very well for putting in the shadows on the rock faces up at the top and the green of the shrubbery that's actually on the face of the rock of Hollister Peak. We have an interesting thing happening is the sunlight hits the distant mountains up at this point. It's also profoundly affected by the distance. And so you have sort of a contrast of the warm of the, the actual uh, sunlit stones and rocks and bushes up there that are affected by the blue of distance. So to, to make that read right, what I do is I mix white with my hot blue, which is thalo blue. See, these, these trees up in here have to get a lot lighter because they're far away. And the first color that drops out of your palette normally in distance is yellow, but in sunset you have to keep some of that. So as these come up in value, I still I have a warm, my sap green and I cooled back a little bit with um, a touch of the distant uh, uh, phthalo blue to keep it warm. These are just oak trees, there's just tons of them up, well there used to be tons of them up in central California, but they have uh, suffered some, an oak, some sort of a, a, a oak disease and they're dying. So um, in many of the areas along the central coast, of California, the oak trees are now gone, which is a very sad thing. But when I took these pictures back in 1990, there were still plenty of oaks. And I think I like painting the, the idea of the memory of the oaks. As you move across the face of the mountain, the light hits fewer and fewer of the, of the trees. And you still get this feeling of suffused light coming across for an evening shot here. Everything in the sunlight has a touch of cadmium orange in it to tone it, to make it read correctly for the time of day. So it's, it's, there's, in a sunset light painting, it is such a warm painting and it's such a, a painting that people enjoy looking at that uh, I always enjoy get, having an opportunity to paint a, a painting that has so much warmth to it. And I make two piles of paint, one with the orange in it, burnt sienna, and then one with alizarin crimson, and a little bit of the burnt uh, sienna because it's a wooden fence, and the shadow sides will go down to the violet. And you have to add a little bit of white to it so it'll show up next to the trees. 
then we'd have to put in the fence along the front of the barn. I love filberts, they do hold an awful lot of paint. Also put in the back side of that water tank. Really enjoyed painting that water tank. <laughs> and then it's the dark fence, which goes across the front. I think I'm gonna have to switch my smallest brush to do this part of the fence so I can get some detail. So I'll have to paint in between the fence. Sometimes you paint the negative in order to get the fence to actually show up properly. It's a more light orange, almost pure orange. A little bit of white because we are standing on the road. A little yellow. Warm it up. And this is the grass in front of the barn. Oh, how is that ever lovely and bright? But it is because that's where the sun is hitting. This area is the primary focal point and the mountains up above are the secondary. So to force it to be the primary, I have to make more strong color choices here that will bring your eye down and make it stay near where I want you to be. So my strongest orange is here. My strongest white is here. This is lovely, but it's all secondary to what's going on down here. If you ever go inside a barn, the, the dust motes cast light and, and the feeling inside a, a, a rural country barn is, is just a wondrous experience. got the um, blue violet of the sky of the sunset coming on and if you have anything green in the distance like these trees up in here you add the blue violet of the sky and the green of the trees and then it will read right to the viewer watch your value contrasts you can enhance that feel of evening light by by putting more orange into something. I mean, I've got a green tree in the foreground, but I've made so much orange and yellow in it that it reads as a, as a sunset tree, even though you know it's a green tree. Well, those clouds up at the top need a little more enhancement so that they still read as sunset clouds. Lovely orange and and then on the shadow sides of the clouds, we add a little alizarin to the white. the blue, keeping it light because these are clouds, and we add a shadow underneath the clouds that are coming up behind, add a little more of the color, 
bounce light of that encroaching evening sky. Even though the photograph for reference that I'm using for this picture does not have clouds in it, I put clouds in it because I like clouds and it helps the design. I'm going to get some more light over here and uh, on this tree on this side so it contrasts better. And it's orange, of course. Gee, wonder why? Well, you know why. It's orange because the sunset, the sun that's coming in horizontally at a low angle here, is creating a an orange feel to everything that it lands on. A little more on the fencing. Love this old barn. nice. I like that. I think I'm finished. How do you like it? When you understand the concept that with sunset light, everything that's in the sunlit side of anything has cadmium orange in it, and the shadow side of everything has alizarin crimson in it. So remember when you make your shadow colors that you always add alizarin crimson to the shadow sides of anything that you paint. And if you paint the sunset side that's lit by the sun, add cadmium orange. And you will always have a painting that reads as evening light. The color system that I'm using came from a lot of knowledge by a lot of different artists studying the wavelengths of color, the way the human eye perceives them. What I've done is made it very, very simple for you to use this color system by dividing the colors into two separate families, warm colors for sunshine, cool colors for shadows and distance, crossing over only occasionally. And if you look at the graph of my hands right here, you'll see about it the percentages necessary to have a successful painting all of your distances and shadows, all of your sunlit areas with the warm colors, and if you cross over you only do it in a very small area in only certain areas of the painting. I'm going to show you a whole bunch of slides that talk about each one of my paintings. The first one is a golf course in morning light. Please look at all of the yellows that you see in the sunshine. Uh, definitely a morning light painting done in La Quinta, plein air. The second painting is Keeneland Counterpoint Morning, and again it's a morning light painting. You can just see how cool and yellow the entire atmosphere seems. That's what makes a morning painting. These are featured um, as part of my earlier videos. Jump for Joy, though, is definitely an evening painting. I want you to note all of the alizarin that compromises the greens and takes them down to a gray color in the shadow areas, and of course the orange is everywhere in Jump for Joy. Evening Light at Warm Springs is a painting that was done on location just before the sun went down bef below the mountains. You can definitely see that this is an evening light painting by the strong oranges on the grasses in the foreground. Cheetahs is a very large painting. Uh, it's almost uh, six feet wide, but definitely an evening light painting. Of course, you probably figured this out by seeing the highlights. The shadow areas on the cheetahs are done with yellow ochre, which is orange in shadow. Tanaha is an evening painting done on location. Again, you can see that it's suffused with that warm evening light, which you now know is done by the addition of cadmium orange to all of your sunlit mixes. The next painting is Washing a Clydesdale uh, from work that I did while I was up at uh, the um, Draft Horse Classic. And, of course, evening light is very strong on this one because of the, uh, the compromise of orange and alizarin sun and shadow. Now I did a whole series of pairs. I just put up my floodlight on top of the pair, or on the side of the pair, and I thought about the colors and I made a whole series of them. Evening pair and the next one is noon pair and you can see by the light underneath the pair, uh, the color rather under the pair, that the shadow is so blue because of the overhead suffusion of, of the sky. This painting was done um, washing a horse at noon. The shadow areas also have the reflected light of the water, and the water is handled with the hot blue. So are the details on all of the um, uh, sparkly areas on the horse's back. Noon oak is a painting showing you again noon light. The oak is at a slight distance, so you'll see a lot of blue-green in the top of the oak, reflecting the sky off of it. Uh, but oaks are generally kind of a gray color. 
This is a similar painting to the one that's done in the video, which shows you the same horse and rider in a different colored coat. Again, noon light, and notice all of the lovely reflections underneath the shadow of the horse. Uh, that's just how, it, that's so fun. Now, Water Wars is a noon light painting, but it's done with not strong noon light. It's overcast, so you have to, it's very subtle, and you have to understand that sometimes you handle paint subtly in order to convey an emotion about a, a place. Noon light at Idlewild was done, um, morning light rather, at Idlewild was a plein air piece done for a competition last year. It took best in show. It's only 12 by 16, but you can see the morning light softens everything. And this is out in the desert of California, morning light palm. Even though you see orange on the fronds of the palm that are dying, uh, it's still definitely a morning light painting. If you look off into the distance, you can see all of that yellow. Now here we have Moonlight Paws, which is the painting that's done in the first of the series on color. And the pause is uh, definitely the moonlight colors with dropping the, the warms from your palette. Certain warms, not all of them. Here we have the Morning Light painting that is also part of the first DVD. Um, this teaches you how to do those Morning Light paintings with a lot of warm, or rather cool, yellow light in those early morning times. And my next DVD is going to be featuring backlit subjects, and you can see that in this painting, backlighting can be handled very easily, well, once you've learned how to do it. And of course, that's the subject of, uh, of my next video. And finally, this last painting I want to show you is um, pines, backlit pines. Uh, when you have a sun that's directly behind you and you're actually looking into it, you can really learn how to handle the light and color. I want to thank you for joining me in painting these two paintings during this video. There's a third video in the series coming up, and in that video I'm going to be painting sunset backlighting and also early morning and late afternoon light. These lightings are different than what you saw in this demonstration, and I hope you'll join me again for another video. Remember, if you paint the right color in the right location when you do your work, you'll always end up with a painting that effectively depicts the time of day. Thank you again for joining me in this colorful oil painting number two. If you have any questions at all about what you saw in the video, please write to me, either with my email or my postal address. I'll be happy to contact you and answer any questions you may have. As a teacher, one always wants to teach. Thank you so much again. Makeup is not what I do. <laughs> I paint pictures. Ah. In all of the paintings in the three vi in video, I spy you. Pfft. value scale. Oh, darn it. Coyotes. <laughs> How about a good chorus of coyotes and local dogs? This is where I wish I had a fashion pencil. <laughs> Often through my canary is singing. Well, there you go folks, you get a canary. <laughs> Try a little zoomy. This camera is a jerky thing. Why is it so jerky? You want to see my view of my studio? Uh, yeah, okay. That's not the idea. The camera jerks. That's it. Ooh, I need to be closer. Hello. I'm enhancing. Oh, what am I doing? Oh, darn. I'm enhancing something. <laughs> I know you can see my face now. George, I think she's got it. Ah.